So I'm very, very pleased and honored to be joined by Dalal Mahawad, who is a journalist and Associate Press senior producer. Um, thank you so much for joining. Um, for Dalal is a Lebanese journalist, uh, currently working as a senior Middle East and North Africa video producer at AP. Previously, she worked as a regional video producer for United Nations Refugee Agency, covering displacement in the Middle East and the world. She's also been part of teams at Al Jazeera and LB LBC International, where she mainly covered human rights, refugees, and environmental issues. She has a master's degree in international political economy from the London School of Economics and a master's degree in journalism from Columbia University in New York, um, where she graduated with honors. Dalal, thank you so much for joining us and for you sharing for your experience me. with us. Um, I think a first, the first question that I'd like to start with um, is a really simple question. Um, how did you find yourself being drawn towards the world of journalism? Um, it goes back to when I was really, really young, uh, to be honest. Um, I always wrote about things um, around me, things that I experienced um i had i mean it might sound you know very common but i had yeah. this little diary and i used to write to my parents and to my friends and write about my feelings and then as, as i grew up i started you know experiencing different things and meeting people and seeing things around me that maybe did not seem right or, you know, that triggered certain emotions. And I remember that the first piece I wrote, I didn't know that I wanted to be a journalist, but I was on a school trip and we visited a, a center for disabled children. Mm -hmm. And I remember having these like mixed, you know, emotions and feelings and being sad. And I told my teacher I wanted to write something about it. And I did. And, it got published in, in the school um, newspaper. And um, I mean, throughout my teenage years, I felt like I wanted to use my voice okay. to write about other people who have no voice. So, it, I mean, it started with this little story about disabled children, but then it, it turned into all kinds of topics. Um, and when you grow up in a country like Lebanon, where there are so many issues, you go through wars, um, you, you are personally affected, yeah. uh, you see injustice everywhere you go. There are events around you that, that trigger, that trigger that. Yeah. And I really went into this uh, with one vocation, that is, you know, being the voice of people who are voiceless, as cliche as this might be might sound um and unfortunately the media spectrum was so polarized it was so politicized it was really dangerous um yeah. to be a journalist um when i was in my you know in college when i went to to aub i wasn't 100 percent sure that it was it was the time so i i my undergrad had nothing to do with with journalism and I kind of kept postponing this decision. I was, as I was telling you earlier, my parents were discouraging me. Um, there were journalists that were being killed for being outspoken. Um, and then one day I saw something. It's an issue that again, triggered feelings and emotions. And I got angry. Yeah. I was, it was, just in front of my office, I was, I was working as a researcher at the National Democratic Institute in Beirut. Yeah. Um, and there was this beautiful old heritage home uh, mm -hmm. that was being destroyed. Um, and I was wondering why. And I got really angry and I was like, this beautiful gem, well, what is going on here? And I started doing research and my, my boss, um, who unfortunately passed away a few weeks ago, told me, you know, this is what's going on in, in Beirut. I, I see a lot of these houses being demolished and destroyed. And you know what, maybe you should write something about it. Yeah. I just, it was too much pressure on me, but then I was like, yeah, why not? And that was my first actual piece of journalism. I wrote about, um, 
the title of the article was called was a lost city so it's talking about how you know beirut was losing its identity it was published in now lebanon it was in 2009 and as I was telling you earlier, it got picked by one of my favorite publications. It's called Le Courrier International. And it's a publication that I used to read when I was in school. And I was like, oh my God, like this is me in Le Courrier International. And I felt like this was a sign that, you know, I, I should really pursue uh, my, um, you know, me being want, wanting to be a journalist. Yeah. And so I, I started writing and then switched careers and went to Colombia, uh, although I already had a master's. So, and again, like it wasn't easy going to Colombia because when you have a full-time job and you already have a master's and you don't have money saved and you go to your parents and you're like, oh, listen, I'm going to switch careers <laughs> now at 25 and uh, are you happy to help me, you know, to go to school again? And then they say no. And so, yeah. but I'm glad I did what I did. I mean, it's, it was very obvious to me that this was where my passion was. And yeah. So I'm curious. I mean, you said a couple of things that, um, that um, spur a bunch of questions. Like one, for you, it seems like journalism directly comes, um, comes out of some, felt obligation for advocacy, right? This idea of I want to tell untold stories and advocate for people without a voice. Um, or even, I guess, like even buildings, the buildings without a voice, so to speak, like um, speak up for those who need speaking up, for, uh, who those need, for those who need a voice. Um, do you feel like your colleagues all feel the same way? Is this a, okay, yeah. Because no. I don't, I don't <laughs> think that that's the case. No, not everyone gets into journalism for that. I mean, some people want to be in politics, like they yeah. want to cover politics, they want to cover security. Some people are in art, you know, it's, it's different. And some people even believe that, uh, you know, as a journalist, you might be giving a voice indirectly, but you are, you are not an activist. You are, you're, you are yeah. not, I mean, I'm not an activist. I'm still telling stories and I'm respecting, you know, uh, the professional boundaries of being a, a journalist. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, I went into this with a purpose and I don't yeah. think just like being a doctor or a humanitarian worker, to me, journalism is more than just a job and it requires a lot of sacrifice and it takes an emotional toll on you. And it's not easy being a journalist. And even yeah. my other colleagues who don't believe in what, what, I believe in would tell you that it's not easy being a journalist. So yeah, yeah to me, it's, it's more than just a job and you, you can create your own purpose or no purpose, like no specific purpose. You know, it's, yeah. to me, I there mean, was, there was a meaning to what I was doing and it was what was driving me, you know, to do what I was doing. Yeah. I think it's a challenge for journalists in the region in particular, but maybe it's a global challenge, but in the region in particular to maintain um, impartiality, right? And to sort of not be seen as activists uh, and not be seen as uh, political, political entities. Um, how have you managed that? How have you sort of um, made yourself, how have you maintained not being the story and sort of have the story be the story? It's the way you tell the story. You know, it's, it's what you, the basics that you learn in journalism school. I, I don't believe in, in objectivity, to be honest. No, no journalist is objective because even when you're like, the, the angle of your, your camera or, you know, the sound bite mm -hmm. that you hit in an interview or the angle of your story in, in general, what you choose to have in or, or out, how you write it, this is all subjective. I think what yeah. you do is you try to be balanced. You have all sides of a story, right? You give everyone a voice. Mm -hmm. uh, your opinion is, is just not, not there. Uh, but I care about a subject, so I write about it. And I know that indirectly, you know, I am helping the people who are concerned by, by the story. So you don't necessarily have, you don't have to have an opinion. I mean, this is, this is not journalism in, in yeah. that but it's really how you tell um, the story, uh, basically, that, you know, differentiates you from other people who, unfortunately, yeah, you can clearly see that they do play the role of an activist in, yeah. 
you know, in their reporting or in their storytelling. I mean, it's a very thin line. Um, it's a super thin line, yeah. It's a very thin line and it really depends on the media outlet where you're working because some media mm -hmm. outlets would let you cross that line and some wouldn't. Yeah. The AP, this is, is, this is never going to happen. This is yeah, the AP is like the pinnacle of don't cross the line. Yeah. Apolitical, uh, independent, you know, news agency. Uh, and then it depends on the news, news agenda of the media outlet because then you can cross the line on certain issues and not on, on others, right? So, yeah. yeah. But as a journalist, it's really the way you tell the story that differentiates you from, uh, from other people. Yeah. I mean, right I'm curious, so. yeah, I'm curious how you got into video journalism in particular, um, because they're, uh, you know, written and video journalism are very clearly different, different media. Um, and the medium dictates so much about what you're able to tell. You've done some really, um, really compelling work in video. I'm curious if you were just brought into that because you moved into Al Jazeera or was it a conscious choice? I want to move into no, it was a conscious choice so i started as a print journalist as i told you like i was just writing and when i wanted to do the career switch and go to columbia i uh, applied to uh, to the broadcast program because yeah. i believe that okay i mean i can acquire writing skills and i can improve but i wanted to learn technical skills and i really believe that image is more powerful than anything else no matter how thorough how how good your text is there's something that you can convey in an image, in a, in a video, especially mm -hmm. video, because it's not just, it's an image with, with sound, right? Yeah. Uh, that's the most powerful message that you can convey. Um, yeah. So I went for that medium consciously because I knew that was the best way to tell stories, in, in my opinion. Not that the other mediums are not, but what happens nowadays is you you don't really specialize in anything you have to know how to do everything the market requires you to be you know yeah write shoot edit but yeah i'm specialized in in video and i i made that choice yeah so i'm there are, the there are many questions should we answer them now or or later no, i'm gonna i'm gonna keep them towards the end because i oh. want them to ask them themselves okay. in their in their voice and be able to adjust because so we'll get to the questions for sure but everybody keep asking the questions um so uh of the journalists i've spoken to um you're a little unique insofar as you work for a u.n agency um as a video producer trying to tell the stories not for any specific um publication can you just explain what that means just as if you were speaking to you know a teenager what does it mean to work for the un as a person yeah. who's a trained journalist so so i worked for a un um agency that cared for refugees specifically so what i would do is i would go on the field and i would tell the stories of refugees and displaced people around the world and that video that i produce that story that i produce Mm -hmm. would get distributed to media outlets. So it would get published on actual like news agencies yeah. and, and media outlets, but it also goes on the UN uh, platform. Was that your question? Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. Um, th the question is, I guess it's a broader question and I think I know the answer to, the, to it, but the question is why? Why go to the UN? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I'm gonna be very honest with you. He, yeah. Here are, here's why. Um, I was really, really interested in the refugee story. Um, the UN headhunted me actually when I was still at LBC because it was 2014, 2015. It was the peak of uh, the influx of refugees into uh, Lebanon and the Arab, uh, you know, the, the host countries in the Arab uh, region. It was also at the time when refugees were making their way to Europe. Yeah. And I was one of those few journalists who were really telling the story of refugees from a human interest perspective. Uh, and looking at them as you know, individuals, human beings who've been, you know, had to flee their countries, who've been through so many difficulties. I did not look at this from a political angle. I did not look at this you know, from a, a populist um, angle like yeah. other local journalists were doing. And 
you know, I was very, they used to label me the refugee reporter at, uh, here in, in Lebanon because mm -hmm. I covered all refugee stories. I was the first one in Arsal and the first one in the Beka. And, yeah. and they thought I was biased towards the refugees. And I was like, how can you buy, be biased towards refugees? I'm biased to, you know, towards human rights, maybe. Yeah. He's, I'm just telling their stories. Um, and the UN offered me the job, you know, telling me, would you want to join and keep telling the stories of refugees from around the region? So one, I was interested in the story. Two, I wanted to go more regional, broader. I didn't want to stay like local. Um, I felt like, you know, my storytelling about refugees could, you know, go to a wider audience. Yeah. I really believed in their cause personally. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I was biased towards refugees if, um, this is what they were saying and it paid well, the job yeah. paid well. Uh, I'd be very honest with you. I was really tempted by, you know, the, the package they offered me. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be to work with foreigners, to be, because I was working in, in local media for two years. Uh, yeah. And I felt like the team that I was going to be part of uh, had really like veteran journalists, some experienced people that I could really learn from. So in that uh, time, what, what did you learn about the, the sort of broader refugee story across the region that you didn't know before going into it? Uh, I, you know, you were just talking about blind spots. I think yeah. that there were there are many blind spots in the media narrative of the refugees. Yeah, there were too many negative narratives, too many negative stories. Refugees being depicted as something very abstract, like a mass, like a group, mm -hmm. figures, facts, and it's very dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what I wanted to focus on, and I try to do that. At, you know, in, in my job at LBC to a certain extent, but I could do much more at UNHCR was really to tell these individual stories and to focus on empowering yeah. positive stories that are desperately needed in the media narrative because there was an audience fatigue. People were sick of these negative stories. I mean, if, you know, there are all these difficulties and issues related to refugees, no one wants to host refugees. If you don't see them in a positive yeah. light, you don't see them as contributors to your society. Like this so, one you have up here is really a good example of that. Yeah, this so th this is where I saw, you know, there was something different, there was an added value, there was, there was room for me to work differently. And with the UN, you're not working for a news agency or a media outlet, so you're not in a rush. You yeah. can spend time with your characters. You can go in depth with the stories. Yeah. Um, and although maybe the end product looks a bit like what a news report looks like, um, you do the work of a documentary filmmaking. Yeah. It, yeah, so... It totally makes sense. I mean, for me, I, I found it really interesting as I sort of was diving into your work to, to get a sense of like, oh yeah. Um, the one thing, just because Africa is sort of a, a historically geared program, I'm curious, how has the refugee story, the capital R, capital S refugee story, changed um, in this century versus last century? Um, are there stories that are, have, haven't been told or that need to be told or have been told but not many people know about it across the region? Like over I, the last I, I like, think the, the last you know, century, we weren't that connected and we weren't able to share stories the way we do now. There was no internet, there was, I mean, later at the end of the 20th yeah. century, there was, but social media, um, you know, finding stories was more difficult. It's very easy now to find stories because of the way we are interconnected. Uh, yeah. So, so that, yeah. And I think the, the positive contribution of refugees has not been highlighted enough in the media uh, narrative. And this is why you have all these misperceptions about refugees being a burden. They're always depicted as a burden. But I have told, I have, and there are many others who did too, you know, so many stories about refugees who are innovators, who are contributors to the economy, who are, you know, social innovators. They're, 
they had uh, they were helping others when they needed help it's just i've met people that will inspire me for the rest of my life to be honest yeah and then you know the strength they find in in all this hardship and all this misery it's there's there's beauty in in their pain as as you know as horrible as this might sound they they were really really very very inspiring and there's yeah. a lot of resilience that you don't see unless you sit with these people and you spend time with them and you tell their stories and yeah really i i think this resilience is like understated in, in so many ways there's two other um broader communities that i want to talk to you about because i feel like there it's a there's a through line in your work that focuses them on them one of them is uh, migrant workers uh, mm -hmm. it seems like a big part of your work or at least your emotional um headspace when it comes to your work focuses on um migrant worker rights um in lebanon and throughout the moon um how did you start doing that work how are you doing that work now um, if you can talk a little bit about that, that would be useful. Um, yeah, this is an issue that I actually started reporting on when I was a local uh, journalist. Yeah. And really, I didn't realize the, how big the magnitude of the problem until I started working on it. And I heard the stories of these domestic migrant workers and, you know, this neo-slavery system that is called kafala and that exists in only in the arab world the sponsorship yeah. system um and this is again what i said that you know some journalists go into this with a purpose like i went there with like i have i had a i wanted to make something out of what i was doing and these this is one of the topics that I was hoping to have an impact um, yeah. through my storytelling. And, you know, you go through these phases of despair, to be honest, because I'm talking about now, what, seven years? Yeah. It's the, the issue. It's like, a, it's a protracted problem. And now it's getting worse because of the economic uh, yeah. crisis wars. And again, it's, it's not just because it's migrant workers that I care about. It's more about, you know, this is basic human rights. Yeah. And as a journalist, and I remember very well, when we were graduating at Columbia, um, the yeah. dean of our journalism school said that you as journalists cannot stand still in face, you know, in, in the face of injustice. Yeah. And this is me. I cannot stand still when I see an injustice. Okay, I'm not an activist, but I'm going to write about it. And I'm going to try to give a voice to these people. And so, maybe policymakers, the public, you know, the audience is going to stir a debate. It's going to lead to, to a policy change eventually. Yeah. So if you could just, if I can put you on the spot for a second, um, because there are a lot of people on the call and in our broader community who are on varying degrees of awareness of what kafala means. Um, so if you could just do almost kafala 101, like what is it legally? Like what is the actual legal structure that is promoting and defending this injustice? So it's, uh, first of all, people under kafala are, are not under the labor law, okay? Okay. So they are under a specific labor law that is called the sponsorship system okay. through this system um and this might sound awful but this is really in a nutshell what it is your employer owns you owns you as in you cannot quit your job if you want to quit your job uh also for your employer he if he needs to fire you he will lose a lot of money because employers pay huge amounts of money to these uh service providers bureaus that exist around uh, the country to be able to recruit these people and as a worker you come you rarely read your contract before you come it's not even translated into your own um, language uh, you are told there are certain working conditions you end up with other working conditions that are most of the time worse and you can't do anything about it it's a very very meager salary if your employer doesn't pay you, you can't do much about it. And 
that's what's happening now is there's an economic crisis. These are workers that used to get paid in dollars because Lebanon was a dollarized economy with a pegged exchange rate. Now people don't own dollars anymore and they're not paying their uh, workers and the workers can't do anything. And what happens is that most of the time, because you can't quit your job, you run away. This is what they say. They yeah. ran away as if yeah. you're in prison, right? Like you only run away when you are in prison. So they're running away and yeah, and a lot of them live in shelters managed by NGOs. Uh, now there's a crisis uh, at the embassy of the Ethiopian embassy Ethiopian because embassy. Ethiopian workers are protesting there. They want to be repatriated. And it's just horrible because you work 24 hours seven, you live in your employer's house. You don't get a day off if your employer doesn't want to give you a day off your salary is really, really nothing compared to the long working hours. You can get abused, you can get raped. I've heard stories of abuse and, and rape that are horrible. And you know that the system is terrible when statistics say that two domestic workers commit suicide per week in Lebanon. Wow. This is insane. And yeah, it's an abusive system. So is it in the, in, the decade of, um, in the decade that you've spent sort of working on this and chipping away at this, are there, um, are there politicians who have, sort, or policymakers who have started to buy in uh, and to start to realize this is an issue? Uh, do you feel like um, in, on Main Street, so to speak, more people are willing to actually march and say, this is not gonna- Yeah, not only, gonna only, re only recently. So in terms of policymakers, not this Minister of Labor, but the one before, um, started a dialogue with a lot of NGOs and he promised to amend uh, the system. And he was you know, asking them for an alternative uh, you know, labor law for these uh, migrant yeah. workers. It didn't go anywhere as, as far as, as I know. It was still like a, a dialogue. And then you know how like, you have yeah. governments change very often. Um, but yeah, on, on the street, we, we saw that in the uprising, in the protests mm -hmm. since October. Uh, you have graffitis in downtown Beirut, um, you know, saying, you know, we're, we're all for the rights of domestic workers, abolish kafala. But not enough, Mikey. I was in a protest um, last year and most of the protesters were foreigners and journalists. I didn't, I didn't see a lot of Lebanese or there were Lebanese who worked in NGOs, you know, like anti-racism movement, CAFA, you know, all these NGOs that... So not enough and people don't speak up. You, there are... I've been in horrible situations in my life. Like when you are sitting yeah. in a restaurant and you see a woman with a domestic worker who's not sitting on the table while that woman and her family are eating. Yeah. And I've, you know, I, I can't stand still as I was just saying, and I yeah. just can't shut up. I mean, the activists in me just burst and yeah. it's just, I, I can't, it's, you know, it's an existential crisis for me to be around people who are you know living through these conditions and so yes i've tried to use my voice and my work to shed light on this just like i did with other groups so i mean this is one of the issues that i've worked yeah. on how did you first start working with um the lgbt community in lebanon and, and regional reporting on them uh reporting on that, uh, it's, that it's story just like migrant workers when i was at lbc um, yeah. Because I mean, this is right, we're talking here about local issues that are very specific to, to Lebanon. Um, it was another community that I thought was marginalized, that did not yeah. have a voice, and that was mis misperceived. And just the narrative that's out there in the media is just not right. It's one side of the story, or it's a completely distorted yeah. uh, image of the story. These are individuals who are usually depicted in Lebanon, including by the media as parias, you know, as sick people, as abnormal, as, you know, they have no rights, they should live in the shadows, etc. So I, I did a few stories uh, with LBC and I, I made some contacts with local activists who were working on, on the topic. 
And I still felt after I left that, you know, this was still underreported on and, yeah. you know, more works, more work needs to be done on this specific community, especially from an Arab journalist to an Arab audience. Yeah. I was going to say, a, lot, there are a lot of uh, documentaries and stories that have been done by the foreign press. Uh, and those two are not, they don't really depict the image as, as is. Also depicting Beirut as this rosy, very liberal place where, whoa, it's like LGBT rights. I don't think that's accurate either. Um, with UNHCR, I worked on LGBT stories among refugees because UNHCR is a big advocate for LGBT rights. Yeah. And, you know, they protect refugees or individuals who've been persecuted based on their gender or sexual identity. Um, and then I decided, you know, I, I wanted to do some more and I started doing more research. And that's when I met a transgender woman in Tripoli in the north of, um, of Lebanon. And I decided to tell her story. And I did like a short film that's about five minutes long. Is it that this one that we're looking at? On Daraj, yes. It was yeah. published um, back, I think, last year. Um, and I spent a lot of time, you know, it's, it's not easy telling these people stories because you need to gain access to their lives. You need them to trust you. They've been persecuted. They've been living in the shadows for so long. So they, you know, it's not easy for them to open up. Um, and now I have a lot of friends, not just contacts in, in the community, I mean, in, in Lebanon. Um, and yeah, I'm working on a, on a documentary actually. So I, after I did my, my short film about this transgender women, yeah. I pursued my research and I you know, stumbled upon a character that uh, I really admire and she's a friend now. And um, I'm trying to actually work on a long form feature documentary about her life. Great. Uh, Great. And I'm partnering with a co-director because I haven't worked on a feature film um, before. So I, I could use someone's, you know, experience. Yeah. And we're at the stage where we're uh, applying for funds through producers and a production company. So I, I hope that sees the light. That's great. That's very exciting. Um, Dalal, I'm going to ask you four Africa questions, and then we're going to open it up to everybody. Yeah. Um, so very quick, rapid fire. Um, what are you reading or watching right now? Oh, good, because I just started watching and reading something yesterday. Uh, I'm reading um, All the Lights We Cannot See. It's a Pulitzer Prize uh, novel. Okay. And I'm watching uh, The Young Pope. It's a series by Paolo yeah. Sorrentino, uh, which I'm a fan of. Great. Um, if you could uh, shadow somebody from the past or present for a day, who would it be? From the past, Frida Kahlo. I'm obsessed with that woman. Nice. Why are you obsessed with her? Um, I think she symbolizes everything I believe in, in terms of feminism. I consider myself as a feminist. Uh, I think, you know, she was a pioneer feminist in many ways, but I also admire, you know, all the beauty that came out of her pain and, you know, her hardship. This is a woman that suffered a lot and yet, you know, she was able to produce art and yeah. make beautiful things and... Beautiful. You know, yeah. What do people most misunderstand about your work or your profession? I think they underestimate the emotional and psychological toll of this job. Yeah. yeah. They just don't get it. It's very hard to be in a refugee camp for a whole week at the border between Greece and Macedonia and to come back to your nice house with a garden and to live your life as if, you know, yeah. or to be in a war zone and the next day to just, you know, normal, yeah. going to the movies. <laughs> Uh, it's the emotional and the psychological toll, you know, it's because you get, you know, you meet people and you go into their stories. It's, yeah. It's tough. I saw you posted at some point about like uh, the PTSD associated with uh, reporting yeah. in conflict zones. 
I, I used to, I never lived in a conflict zone, but I was a public school teacher in, in the ninth ward in New Orleans for a long time. And like, there was so much work uh, done around PTSD for public school teachers in those types of situations. So I very much relate to that. Yeah, and journalists don't realize that there's a, I realize that there's a form of passive PTSD because mine actually yeah. started as a passive form even before I went on the field because I was, I spent a whole year at Al Jazeera English on something that's called the Syria desk, dealing every day with like 50 videos coming in from Syria, talking to activists yeah. on the ground. I, I was really sitting uh, on my desk. I was safe in Doha, but it got to me and yeah. okay last one um whose work do you admire or are inspired by um well that's a broad question but i'll maybe i'll mention a journalist because you know this is what i do sure definitely lise doucette from the bbc their chief international correspondent i admire that woman and i really believe in journalists who spent you know most of their careers on the field i think these are the you know the good journalists okay uh, great. you learn so much from the field uh Dilad, i'm going to open it up to everybody um dina I think you're still on. We're gonna start with you. If you could keep it to one question, that would be great just because there's a lot of very good questions. So Dina, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask the question, go ahead. Um, thank you both so much for this. And I'm Hi, Hi, how are you? Um, I'm glad you started talking about the queer community and I was wondering if you could speak more about the Queens of Beirut documentary, um, maybe how it came about or yeah, so this is the documentary that I mentioned. Uh, I am looking at uh, the story of a woman who actually nurtured uh, the drag queen scene in Lebanon. There's a, a thriving underground uh, drag queen scene in Beirut. Uh, and I was lucky enough to actually follow the development from the beginning. So we're talking about two and a half years ago. Um, so really, I was looking for a, po a positive narrative about the uh, queer community. As I said, I feel like these are the blind spots in, in the media uh, narrative. And I was amazed by these, you know, young queer people who were actually using art and performance to express their identity and despite the fact that we still live in a country where homosexuality is criminalized and you know there could be a police raid at, at the club where they're performing they could be you know persecuted um, just you know for for doing what they're doing but they they're doing something very smart because they're going on stage and they're using art and i think this is how they're protecting themselves and I thought that, you know, through this story, I could tell, you know, some individual stories of queer people in the community who have had their own struggles and who really um, depict the struggles of, of the community. So yes, this is a positive and empowering narratives because these are individuals who are doing something, you know, uh, and who are resisting the status quo in a very creative way. But at the same time, of course, as I said, not everything is rosy and happy and easy. Um, that I would tell um, you know, their, their personal struggles. And this is why it's called Queens of Beirut. Now the film's name might change so it's up to the, to the producers. But when I got the funding from Afak, that was uh, the name of the film. And the film follows a specific uh, character, but there are also other characters. Um, yeah, and um, Maybe one day you'll get to watch it. <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful. It's, yeah. it's my first experience with, you know, long form, and it's very hard to find funding. Uh, very you know, exciting. Well, I'm looking forward to it, and thank you so much. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Hi, Dela. So you can unmute um, yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, we hear you perfectly. Yep. Okay, great. So um, I had two questions, but I'll ask this one. I think, uh, you know, as you said, you don't, you know, it's it's very subjective world, the world of journalism. It's not always objective, um, but I think there is truth. And I think part of the work is uncovering that. And so 
in this increasingly blurred facts media environment, how do you find, check for, uncover truth um, in your stories? Yeah, truth is the ultimate objective, of course. Um, it's, it's easy and it's difficult at, at the same time. Um, I never publish or you know, put out something I am uncertain of or something that I have not checked with at least two independent sources. I mean, this is the basics of journalism that you learn um, in school. And then definitely not repost or republish something I have not checked myself, at least not on a professional um, account. Um, and then I always go to sources that are considered credible, sources that I've worked with before, that I always go uh, to, because you need to fact check your source before you fact check what they tell you. Um, so yeah, was that your question? Yeah, I think so. And I think um, you, maybe more than that, do you have to ever go beyond that? Um, is that enough? Are there moments where you're having to um, dig deeper or investigate a little bit more? Um, yeah, of course. I mean, it, it depends on, on the issue. There are things that are, you know, you can easily check. And others, you know, especially in Lebanon, it's, there's no access to data. It's very, very hard. You always have to rely on informal sources, on, you know, secondary uh, data. So it's difficult. And this is why, you know, building credible sources is, is essential in a place like Lebanon, whereas maybe in the U.S. access to information is, is much easier. Um, so yeah, you, you sometimes have to, to dig deeper and it's, I mean, this is the basic formula, but sometimes, you know, it, it requires a, a lot of work and it might put you in danger. It might, you know, you try to be ethical because sometimes to get to a piece of information or, you know, to a source, they ask you weird things, you know, it's just like, is this ethical? Can I do that? Yeah. Um, you know, people have asked me for money. People have asked me for a day on a, to go on a date. People who've asked me, you know, for something in return. I mean, these are no-nos, right? Um, but yeah, you, I mean, the, the few investigative, I, I think in investigative pieces that I've worked on also, it's not just fact-checking with sources, is you immerse yourself in the story. You embed right? Yeah. And so you get to know the people, you get to know the story. It's, it's also, it reflects your own experience mm -hmm. of, of that story of, you know, of that issue you're working on. Yeah. So you also trust your own experience with that. Uh, Dalal, just to add one last uh, question onto that. Um, who in this space regionally is doing really good work on data um, that, you know, like, help empowering journalism and empowering journalists. Um, are there research institutes that you find yourself going back to over and over again because they're doing really solid work? Um, I mean, there are the international ones and there are, yeah, some, uh, it depends really on, on the issue, but like the universities, like I've used a lot at San Ferris Institute at AUB for uh, data and facts about refugees. You would be surprised, although I was at UNHCR, but even when I'm not at UNHCR, they have a great, um, they have a great uh, professor who wrote, you know, a book. So yeah, mainly universities, so AUB to me is a, and especially Isam Ferris Institute is, is a great uh, place to go to for data. There are, you know, the usual Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, because they do also in-depth uh, research that we, yeah. uh, there's the Samir Asir Foundation also yeah. on everything that's media related, uh, you know, press freedom, um, some foundations, yeah, but it's, it's not that easy in Lebanon. Again, like it's we lack that. Okay, um, thanks. I'm gonna we're gonna have Laura up next, um, and I think we have four or five more questions. So I'm gonna try to keep you to like two minute answers. Laura, you're up next. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. 
Hi guys. Um, I just wanted to ask, so you mentioned some of the high pressurized situations that you've been in. Um, I wanted to ask that how do you manage stress uh, under those kind of situations? And like, how do you manage to balance your emotions alongside your, your logic and that kind of thing? <clears throat> yeah. Um, listen, at, at the beginning, I'm not going to lie to you. I was really bad at managing my stress and it translated into all kinds of <laughs> physical, uh, like I, I had stomach issues. I, you know, all kinds of things, PTSD. So, and I think part of it was not just because the stories that I cover are stressful and I'm in like these uncertain situations. It's also because I also put a lot of pressure on myself mm -hmm. because I, I believe that I have this vocation that I'm going to use journalism to, you know, to give a voice, to have an impact, etc. It was a lot of pressure and it kind of turned into despair and, and anxiety at some point because I wasn't seeing the results I was expecting. I mean, I did. So first of all, I convinced myself that, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to stop expecting, you know, my stories to change uh, the world. I mean, I, I'm, I'm having the impact that I can have. So you, you learn what your limitations are. And you, you realize, you know, that there are so many layers to change and there's so much more resistance than you would even, you accept that. So just accepting what are the limitations of what you can and cannot do. And I started, you know, trying to dissociate when I'm done with my job, especially when I worked with refugees. At the beginning, I used to come home. It would be very hard for me to, you know, go back to normal. Like I would sink into these stories they would kind of haunt me and it would get to me so I also started you know I learned how to cope how to try to dissociate as much as I can um, and I also do therapy to be honest I go to a therapist it's been two years and it's helped me a lot deal with pressure deal with anxiety deal with despair um, and I think these are things that were really triggered by by me being a journalist as you know as simple mm -hmm. as that well yeah. you're amazing you're amazing and a true inspiration so thank you very thank much you. thank you <laughs> hi Dalal. um my question you touched upon a little bit in your last answer but um i came across your work because i was doing research into migrant workers in the gulf because i lived there for a while and I noticed the same things that you brought up about their rights and how they're, you know, exploited. But um, the more I looked into it, the more I realized that there are so many people who are doing this work, but it's like, sometimes it felt like they were, you know, screaming into the void because you're trying to like dismantle the mentality of populations that have been this way for as long as we can remember, you know? So I found that sometimes that can be really, really discouraging. So how do you, how are you able to persevere and just keep doing the work, even though you can't always see tangible change? Yeah, very good question. I mean, you don't always see tangible change, but you do see some change. I mean, gradually, not every story, not every issue you work on ends up, you know, changing or being solved. But I do feel like specifically on the issue of migrant workers that the past two years, the younger generation is behaving differently. They're more aware of the issues. Uh, there are more voices out there who are speaking out against the sponsorship system. This was not there when I was reporting on the issue seven years ago. So I do see some change and that, you know, it gives me some hope. Um, but I, I think you bring up a point that is very valid and that is to what extent we can keep the same narrative again and again, you know, talking about these stories from the same angle, especially that these are really deeply entrenched in our society's, you know, culture and, and beliefs. And, and I think racism is, is a cultural and a structural problem in, in the Arab world. So I think what the journalists need to do now and maybe this is where we should go, people who are researching or writing about this, is maybe looking at a different angle, looking at this story from a different perspective, offering, I don't know, alternatives to the, sponsor, to the sponsorship uh, system. 
um, I, I don't know, I haven't thought about it, but now that you're mentioning this, I'm like, maybe we need to tell that story also differently. It's the same with the refugee story. I, I, at one point, I think, you know, what UNHCR and, and the comms team was trying to do is to change the narrative because there was a fatigue about, you know, all these negative refugee stories. So maybe we should um, do the same. Um, maybe we can also convince the Lebanese that the sponsorship system is bad for them because it is. It's not just bad for the workers, it's also bad for the employers. They pay a lot of money and they're also stuck in a contract and with an employee they might not like or, or want to have. Maybe if we show them there are alternatives, you know, we can change, uh, you know, their mind about this, uh, this system. So, yeah, maybe we need to look at the story differently. Thank you. Cool. Thanks so much. Uh, we have three last questions. Um, Dalal, if you're okay with that, we'll take, we'll go in order. Yeah. Um, so we have, who's next? Da, 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 da. Um, Rilla, are you still on? Yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. All right. So thanks. This has been really great uh, to, to listen to this. It's my first time tuning in to Africa. Thanks. Um, I, my question, Dalal, is, is really, it speaks, I think, to, to the feminist in you and to the professional woman in you. And I think a lot of women, especially in our culture, feel like they have to balance so many roles at one time. And a lot of time, the career is what gets sacrificed first, especially if it's one that involves risk or uncertainties. Like, I think, you know, your, your journalism career involves and I think your parents uh, understandably you know didn't really encourage you at the beginning given the line of work you wanted to go into so what is your advice to women who want to you know do more in terms of a professional fulfillment uh, yet they're kind of held back by fear of actual risk or fear of uh, perceived risk in life uh, do not fear that risk just take it you're not gonna, you know, what's the worst case scenario is that you, I don't know, you fail. Um, you are worried maybe if you have a family, your partner is gonna, you know, leave you. I, I, I tell this to women, I'm sorry, if your partner is gonna leave you because you have a full-time job and you are ambitious and you have a career, he's just not the right partner. Um, so, and, and I think the first step is actually to get out of that box that we're, we've been put in as women in our very traditional patriarchal societies. Um, you know, get out of, of that box. Your role is, you're equal. You're just equal to, to a man. And if you have a family, why is it okay in our societies for a man to travel for work, to be away from the family, to be career focused, to be the breadwinner. And it's not the women. I mean, you, you need to start you know, believing that your role goes beyond these stereotypes that society has you know, imposed upon you. When you believe that your role is much more than that, you're not gonna be scared to take that risk. You're not gonna be you know, risk averse. You're, you're just gonna go after what you want. And yeah, I mean, that's it. Great, thanks so much. We have Muhammad, you're up next, and followed by Eric. Uh, my question, Dalal, is really focusing on my experience because I used to work for seven years as a journalist in Libya back home because of that home. Wow, tough place, Muhammad. <laughs> During the uh, conflict and everything, but a perspective that I, came to be aware of after starting to work as a journalist and uh, seeing how the national uh, media, meaning inside Libya and outside the Arab media, my question is about, for me, the two main uh, sources of information of news are Al Jazeera and Al Arabiya in, uh, in Arab countries. Uh, but the two have shown biases, unprofessionalism and also for me, I, at least this is my personal opinion, to total disregard to journalistic standards and ethics, like especially in issues uh, concerning Yemen, Libya, which I can attest to personally, the Gulf yeah. crisis, that like the, in, the 
both the entities seem like they took sides in some certain uh, issues. Uh, is there a way for other news channels to appear and win back public trust, uh, do you think? Um, listen, you are totally right. And I worked for Al Jazeera English, which is better than Al Jazeera Arabic, but it's not only on Libya. It's the Arab Spring, it's Syria, it's both biased, both have agendas, unfortunately. And we don't have, when it comes to regional networks, we don't have an independent outlet that we can rely on to get the truth. Um, I think traditional media outlets uh, are kind of dying, like traditional broadcasters, you know, TVs. So I'm not worried about that. Where I see potential is with independent online platforms. Uh, that are emerging and that are covering the Arab and, you know, North Africa. Mm -hmm. And um, by that, there are a few that I can mention, like Rasif, Daraj, uh, mm -hmm. um, Megaphone here in Lebanon, they're really good. And I think a lot of, you know, the young audience is, is going there. Um, and maybe these are the platforms that could bring out a third narrative, you know, um, the truth. Um, you know, the, the problem also is it's a vicious cycle because there's also a financial crisis that the media outlets are going through. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of media outlets have become obsessed with viewership and, you know, how to get clicks per views. And I'm talking here about online, but also the traditional broadcasters, because you don't have advertisement anymore. And even like Saudi Arabia and Qatar at some point, you know, they couldn't spend as much money as, as, as before. So it, it really impacted the content too, and the quality of, of the content and the editorial decision uh, making. Maybe when the media industry is out of this crisis, I still think they're going through that. There would be also more room for, you know, independent uh, reporting and, and journalism. But at the moment, I don't see any Arab network that you can really trust. It's maybe some online independent platforms, unfortunately. Thank you very much. The interesting thing that I, um, about this is that it sort of speaks to the, your earlier point about um, like business models in general, right? And so if we get to the point where um, these independent networks scale and get to the point where they they actually have to their business model needs to work they may suffer the same fate as some of these larger ones as well so that, there's an interesting conversation maybe a, a conversation for another day about yes reimagining totally. the business model of uh large-scale media large i think it needs to be reconsidered and reinvented media. and yeah, it's yeah. really not sustainable and it's, it's a pitfall because this is how you end up with a lot of political money and business money and all these yeah. media outlets. Let's take our last question um, from Eric. My question was uh, uh, maybe a little bit more personal and, you know, most of your work really focuses on um, trying to convince the majority of people of the humanity that these marginalized groups that you cover have and and telling their stories and i'm just curious how do you stay grounded and uh um keep forward with your work when it feels like things just are not changing or or maybe just not progressing quick enough um because i know that at some point there is still an added value for what i'm doing um, even if you don't see tangible change, and please in, intervene if I'm not answering your question. You, you, by putting that story out, by, you know, telling that story, you are putting information out there. You are somehow, you know, teaching people something they didn't know. Um, you are changing their perception, uh, maybe, and, and that's, that's a start. You are allowing these people to tell their stories, no matter where that goes. So, you know, I, I still believe that what I'm doing is meaningful because, again, I went into journalism because I wanted to find purpose and meaning. Mm -hmm. 
So again, that goes back to my personal objective. Um, but as I said, I've, I go through phases of despair and I do become hopeless and I've been in situations where I just want to give up and there's no point. And especially when you live in a country like Lebanon where nothing really changes. I mean, change is minor. As there are issues I've worked on as a local journalist seven years ago. You still see news reports about the same issues today. Yeah. And you're like, oh my God. Like, and, and I'm grateful that I've been able to move out of local to go regional and international because then there are other issues and stories to, to talk about. And you're not stuck in that, you know, in that dilemma of, you know, just becoming, you become redundant. You feel like you're a redundant journalist, you're just yeah. working on the same issues again and, and again. Um, and as I said, and I, I, that was in my, one of my answers, I also taught myself how to accept the limitations of what I do and to try not to go very personal in an issue because it happens. Like last week when I was working on the domestic workers, the, the Ethiopian workers, that night I, I went down and we were filming a story. I mean, I, I was not filming the story. I commissioned the story, right? Because I'm, I'm a senior producer, so I don't always go on, on the field. I, I commissioned the stories. I went down. I couldn't sleep at night. I was like calling all kinds of journalists I knew and NGOs I know and just like tweeting and tagging. And I just couldn't sleep. And the next morning I was like, you know, I, I can't go on like this. This is, I, I can't do this. Yeah. It's, it's just, you have to, to learn that at some point you stop and you know that, you know, I've done my job and, and that's it. And you just don't take it personal that nothing has changed. I used to take it very personal. And I used to cry and I used to say that, you know, fuck it. I don't want to do this anymore. Maybe some journalists don't feel this way. You just, you know, I've, I've met journalists who just go, they report and they go back home. I, I'm not like that. And it's harder. It's like, I'm condemned. You know, it's, a, it's a curse. It's to care so much about the stories that you report on. I, I really, I, sometimes I just don't want to care. I don't want to care. And now that I'm back in news, it's, it's good and bad. It's good in the way that, you know, I, I'm not only focused on marginalized community, uh, uh, communities. I mean, I, I, I commission a lot of these stories and I, I, we try to cover as much as we can, but I do other stuff and I'm trying to diversify, you know, the stories I, I work on because it gets to you. Um, Dalal. Thank you so much. Um, you. You have, you've been such an amazing guest. Um, for those of you who don't already follow Dalal, I've had it up for a while, but um, you should. I'm going to put my Twitter. Yeah, she's not posting the, the personal, the, the pro there. my professional uh, outlet. And then you can also follow me on Instagram. It's a yeah. piece of everything. I just Thanks want to so thank for everyone joining. For, for their time. Um, yeah. with us for more than an hour um, yeah yeah this was great I know the people that I don't know and that I hope to meet and I think the questions were great so yeah this was a lot of fun um, and a lot of, hopefully we can have you back in the in uh, the Africa world soon yes <laughs> thank you okay I'm gonna go See ya. Thanks for everything. Bye. Um, I'll stay online for like another minute if anyone has any other questions. But Delal, thanks so much. You're the best.